Sergei Ilaronovich Kasposkin was a man without a country. Born and raised in the Crimean village of Yepetorian, he had grown up a peasant, working in the fields, on fishing boats, and in factories before his industry and intelligence, combined with the love of the stars, carrying him away from the poverty of rural Russia to the universities of Bulgaria and Germany to earn his PhD in the study of eclipsing binary stars. As he had worked the long hours of a graduate student, he had read papers by Harlow Shapley and Cecilia Payne from the Harvard Observatory, and he had dreamt one day of working in a place where the free exchange of ideas was welcomed not just in the scientific community, but throughout the culture at large. Given his emigre status, he had always been a man on the margins and in the liminal spaces of a Europe that had become increasingly divided. The Great War had not only shattered the long collegiality of great powers and the scientific communities that existed within them, but it had unleashed forces of nationalism and political ideology. In the old mother Russia, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics had come to pass under the dictatorships of Lenin and Stalin. In Italy, Mussolini and the fascists had seized control of the apparatus of government, and in Germany, Hitler and the Nazis had just done the same. In this environment, foreigners were viewed with deep suspicion, and so Kaposkin had been fired from his job at the Babelsberg Observatory in Germany due to fears among Nazi officials that he was a Soviet communist spy. When he tried to return to Russia, he was denied access there because they believed he was a Nazi infiltrator. Thus, he was left without a country, a job, and ostensibly a future. That was when he realized that not only was the Astronome Gelstaff to be held in Göttingen in August of 1933, but that Dr. Payne was to be in attendance there. So, with little more than the clothes on his back, a few dollars in his pocket, and a manuscript detailing his story in his life's work, Kaposkin rode his bicycle 150 miles to the conference to meet with her and ask if she could do anything to get him help to get him to the United States. The word in the immigre community was that Shapley was willing to use his influence and connections in the astronomical community to help those displaced by the rise of the communists and fascists to find places and positions in the West. As he entered the lecture hall, where the talks were to be given during the main sessions of the meeting, he scanned the room for an older woman who he thought might be Dr. Payne. Seeing none, his eyes settled on a younger woman not far from his own age. While he scarcely thought that the well-known and highly regarded Cecilia Payne of the two Cambridges, England and Massachusetts, could be so young, there seemed to be no one else in the hall who it might be. Quietly, he sat a few seats away from her in the rear of the auditorium, and when there was a break in the proceedings, he leaned over and asked in German, Are you Miss Payne? When she responded in the affirmative, he gave her his autobiographical manuscript and asked her to read it. He needed help, he told her, and he hoped that she might be able to put him in touch with Harlow Shapley. For her part, Payne had just returned from a two-week stay at the once-famed Polkolvo Observatory near the former St. Petersburg, now called Leningrad. The atmosphere there had been oppressive, with the director and his staff reduced to poverty and living in fear of arrest if they said anything about their conditions. The experience had been a shock to Payne, and so when the Russian astronomer nearly her own age asked her to read his story, she assented. In fact, being unable to sleep, as her mind struggled to process all that she had seen in the Soviet Union, she stayed up all that night reading it. Both the story of Kaposkin's life and the strength of his scientific work convinced her that she had to try to do something. The next day at the conference, she sought him out. She couldn't promise anything, she told him, but she would try to see if Shapley or anyone else could do something. In her own words, quote, Of course I knew that I must help him to escape the last of the many disasters that had overtaken him. When I saw him the next day, I told him that I could make no promises, but that I would do what I could. End quote. In that moment, the connection would be made between the two. The British woman, who had become a naturalized U.S. citizen just two years earlier in order to pursue opportunities denied her in her own country, 
and the Russian refugee who had traveled across Germany on a bicycle in order to find a lifeline out of an impossible situation bonded over their shared experience. There was also a spark kindled in the heart of one. As Gaposkin would later write, he had expected her to be an older woman, much like the esteemed Annie Jump Cannon, but instead he was thought surprised to find a young woman whose attitude and bearing reminded him of, quote, a ripe peach left alone on a tree, darkened, wrinkled a little on the outside, but more of the delicious inside, end quote. It would take a few months for Cecilia Payne to make good on her intention, but Shapley was, indeed, willing to bring the Russian to Harvard, and at the end of November of 1933, Kaposkin sailed into Boston Harbor with a valid visa facilitated by Payne. Three months later, the pair eloped with Shapley's blessing and were married at New York City Hall, with the director's wealthy friends on hand to act as witnesses. The day after the ceremony, the new bride wrote from Hotel Woodstock to the man who had done so much to facilitate her career, quote, I have never thought that such happiness could be for me, End quote. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. <laughs> The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 37.3, Supplemental. The Harvard Calculators. Cecilia Payne and the stuff of stars. As some of our biographical episodes can be pretty heavy, filled with stories of tragedy, or at least tragically flawed figures, I have to say that it's really nice, really refreshing, to tell a few stories of those whose lives were, by and large, happy, even in times when things on a more global scale were not. As was the case with Annie Jump Cannon, the events of both the Great War and World War II largely passed by Cecilia Payne, at least in a direct way, and so we are left to appreciate her scientific work without having to examine her interaction in or involvement with the scientific entanglements that would ensnare men like Rutherford in the First World War or Fermi, Heisenberg, and Feynman in the Second. Instead, we can focus on what her work was, work which would completely upend astronomers' assumptions about the composition of the universe and set the stage for many of the profound advances in the field of cosmology down the road. So, with that said, let's jump in with the standard biographical introduction. Of all of the women who ended up at Harvard College Observatory, Cecilia Payne was an exception in that she was born and raised outside of the United States. In fact, had it not been for Harlow Shapley's desire to have the observatory begin supervising students doing graduate work and the support of the recently endowed scholarship for women, Payne might never have traveled across the pond to set out on her own course. Payne was born on May 19, 1900, in Windover, England, to Edward John Payne and his wife, Emma Lenora Helena, née Pertz. Her father was a barrister, a historian and a musician, while her mother was of Prussian lineage with brothers who were historians and writers. While her father died when she was only four years old, her mother had enough financial resources to raise her and her two siblings with an emphasis on education and learning, and so it was that she attended St. Paul's Girls' School. While I've not been able to find anything that explicitly says this, it's not unlikely that with the ever-increasing numbers of young men headed across the channel during the years of the Great War when she would have been at St. Paul's, 
She was likely given opportunities that might otherwise have been unavailable to her, much as Paul Dirac was at this time. In 1919, with the war having come to an end, she won a scholarship and was enrolled in Newham College, an all-women's college at Cambridge University. While I've been able to find what it was she did to earn the scholarship, or what her planned course of study might have been when she entered Newham College, it was in a lecture given by the famous astrophysicist Arthur Eddington that her vision for her future seems to have crystallized. We're going to talk about Eddington's scientific work down the road a short ways in terms of the podcast narrative, so let me just mention it very briefly here. When Albert Einstein had published his general theory of relativity in 1916, there were more than a few detractors who claimed that Einstein's reformulation of space-time was wildly inaccurate. While the German was able to correctly account for the anomalies in Mercury's orbit, there was a desire for additional observational evidence to support the theory's claims about the nature of reality. One way to test the theory was to observe whether the effect of the sun's mass on the warping or curvature of space-time produced a certain shift in the path of light through that space-time. An experiment was devised that would observe the stars in the region around the Sun during a total solar eclipse to see if their apparent positions had shifted due to this bending of light. Eddington had been part of a British team, in fact he had led a British team, that had traveled to the island of Prinkeep to make the required observations, and his data had shown that Einstein's theory had correctly predicted the amount of shift seen in the photographs taken at that location. Einstein presented his results in a lecture at Cambridge in which Cecilia Payne was in attendance. Eddington's lecture was so engaging and so enthralling that she rushed back to her dorm room and wrote down every single word from memory. Though she had come to Cambridge to study probably botany and chemistry and maybe just a bit of physics, the lecture had, in her words, transformed her. And so after the period where she did not sleep for three consecutive nights, and no, I'm not making this up, she really didn't sleep for three nights, that's just how abuzz her mind was with the implications of Eddington's presentations. She switched her emphasis to physics and astronomy. Later, she approached the great scientist at a university open house and asked him whether it was possible for a woman to become an astronomer. His response, saying that he could see, quote, no insufferable objection, end quote, launched her on a career tra trajectory that would alter astronomy. In her time remaining at Newnham, she not only took courses in advanced physics, learning the new quantum theory from none other than the great Niels Bohr himself, who was on sabbatical and working with Ernest Rutherford at the university. She reopened the college's long unused observatory. Refurbishing the small telescope, she began to explore the heavens and become familiar with the stars whose spectra she was beginning to learn about. Unfortunately, as many of her professors told her, in spite of Eddington's encouragement, there were no paid position for women astronomers in Britain at that time. In fact, in the 1920s, Cambridge did not even award bachelor's degrees to women at all, and so her only avenue would have been to take a position as a school teacher and attempt to do astronomy on the side. An unlikely prospect, given the poor wages and long hours school teachers tended to have to put in. It was at this point that Harlow Shapley and the Harvard College Observatory came into the picture. Shapley had been hired as the observatory's director, and he replaced Edward Pickering after Pickering had died unexpectedly in 1919. While it would take two years for the appointment to be made permanent due to concerns about whether Shapley was just the right fit for the observatory, he would step in right where Pickering left off and then work to continue to expand the observatory's vision of doing science. Coming from the Mount Wilson Observatory on the West Coast, he had goals of expanding the Harvard Observatory's role in the training of the next generation of professional astronomers as a research institution. Up to that date, Harvard did not offer graduate degrees in astronomy and did not have a hand in teaching any of the classes for the undergraduate curriculum, at least on the part of the observatory itself. Shapley decided that the best way to achieve his goal was not to try to take over the university's undergraduate teaching role, but to augment it by establishing a training path for graduate studies. 
The problem with this, though, is that he had no money to use to offer fellowships to help defray the expenses of students recruited to the program, other than a scholarship that had been established in Edward Pickering's name to support the work in research of a woman astronomer. Shapley decided that this Pickering Fellowship would be the perfect way to begin the program, and so, in 1923, he awarded it to Adelaide Ames, an honors graduate of Vassar College, who had traveled across much of the world and who would deserve a podcast episode of her own if only her, more, her work more closely aligned with the narrative that we're sort of following here. She's really a remarkable woman. This fellowship would pay for a year's work and graduate credit from Radcliffe College with the goal of producing publishable work that would result in a master's degree. Now, as this was all getting set up, Shapley decided to travel to Britain to give a lecture to the Royal Astronomical Society on his groundbreaking work measuring the distance to globular clusters, something we'll go into in greater detail in our next episode. One of Payne's classmates talked her into taking a night off from the Newham Observatory to travel into London to see the lecture, and she was surprised by Shapley's youth, energy, and directness. As she wrote in her journal, quote, He spoke with extraordinary directness and conveyed the reality of the cosmic picture in masterly strokes. He was a man who walked with the stars and spoke with them as familiar friends, end quote. After the lecture, she approached him and told him that she wanted to travel to America to study and work at Harvard. Half serious and half joking, he replied, quote, you can replace Miss Cannon when she retires, end quote. Taking the line as encouragement, whether that's how he meant it or not, she finished up her academic work, which really meant she finished up everything but the actual degree itself, and then gathered together enough financial support that if Shapley awarded her the Pickering Fellowship in 1924, she would be able to come to Harvard and work on a master's degree. Seeing the talent and devotion to the idea that Miss Payne possessed, Shapley put her name forward and everything came together. It's at this point that I want to pause before we take a short break and just admire Cecilia Payne's youthful energy and enthusiasm at this point. Here's a woman pushing into a male-dominated field with just the slenderest thread of encouragement from Arthur Eddington. She not only pushed into the standard areas of her desired discipline, but she pushed beyond that to sit in on the lectures of some of the most revered scientific figures in physics at the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge. Men like Thomson, Rutherford, Bohr, and one kind of has to wonder, Curie. She found a resource long abandoned and revitalized it for her own use in the Newham Observatory, and she managed, somehow, to overcome the almost certain reticence of approaching senior figures in the academic world to ask Shapley for a job at Harvard. To me, it all just boggles the mind that this was done by somebody who was basically a 23-year-old undergraduate. What strength of will she must have had. We know a lot more today about what women in the world of the physical sciences have to overcome to be taken seriously. And this is in a relatively, you know, at least compared to, say, 1923, enlightened time when it comes to things like women's rights and gender equality. Payne would have had very few role models, though it should be noted that almost all of those she would have had would have been at Harvard. And, as we've noted, she had little support or encouragement from the professional community she wished to join. That said, she was able to persevere in spite of all of these obstacles, and that's really nothing short of miraculous. One has to wonder how many other students that knew him over the years might have also entered the field of physics and astronomy had the barriers not been so high. Upon her arrival at Harvard, two things happened fairly quickly. The first was that she was ensconced in Henrietta Swans Levitt's former desk on the second floor of the observatory's brick building. In her first months there, she threw herself into her work, 
arriving early and staying late so often that many who passed by the structure late at night saw the lantern lit and spread the story that it was Miss Levitt's ghost still hard at work classifying variable stars. No longer bound by the mores of proper Victorian society that held that a lady should be home at a reasonable hour, Payne expressed her independence in that most American of ways. She became a workaholic. The other thing that happened is that she and Adelaide Ames became the very best of friends. Cecilia was tall, a bit ungainly, shy, and very much out of her element. Ames, on the other hand, was outgoing and beautiful, engaging in the social life of the observatory, and altogether approachable. So close did the two become that their colleagues began to refer to them as the quote-unquote heavenly twins, and soon they were regular bridge partners with Annie Jump Cannon and her elder sister. Both women were also profoundly taken with Shapley, who they referred to as the DD, or Dear Director, admiring his casual, casual ease of conversation and his often expressed confidence in their ability as researchers. While Shapley had wanted Payne to take up Levitt's work on photometry, she decided to take another path. So what was it that she decided to work on? While studying at Cambridge, she had become immersed in the culture of understanding the structure of the atom and how transitions of electrons from one energy level to another within the atom's quantized electron structure occurred or took place. As we said earlier, she had learned the quantum theory of those transitions and how they produced either absorption or emission spectra from Bohr himself, even as the 1922 winner of the Nobel Prize was struggling, along with his collaborators, to more fully understand how atoms more complex than hydrogen and helium produced the specific spectra that they did. What was understood was that electrons jumped between energy levels in atoms either by absorbing energy, often from a quantum of light known as a photon, to go from a lower energy level to a higher one, or by giving off a photon to drop from a higher energy level to a lower one. The energy of these photons was exactly the same as the difference between the potential energies of the electron energy levels of the atoms, in the same way that steps on a ladder are fixed as some given distance apart. What Bohr had been able to show was that for the hydrogen atom, these energy differences corresponded exactly to the energies of the emission and absorption lines of the hydrogen spectrum specifically to what's known as the Balmer sequence, something we discussed in an earlier episode. A short time later, Bohr was also able to mathematically derive the spectral lines for helium that had lost one electron, something known as the helium becoming singly ionized. These lines, it turns out, matched exactly the strange spectral lines Pickering had discovered in B-class stars back in 1899 that Lockyer and others had believed were due to a new type of element. What all of this showed was that the spectra of a star was due to electrons jumping up and down in the atoms that made up the atmospheres of those stars. The next step, then, was to try and untangle all of the hundreds of lines, not only to determine what the stars were made of, but perhaps how much of each element was present in terms of the, their relative abundances in those atmospheres. This was the particular problem that Payne was interested in it. And this is what Shapley would push her to pursue, not just in terms of her master's degree, but also all the way up through her PhD as original research. From her sort of early exposure to this material, she had already done an in-depth analysis of the spectra of very hot stars that she prepared for publication in the journal Nature. When she indicated her authorship by only using sort of the first two initials of her name, plus her last name, Shapley challenged her by asking if she were ashamed of being a woman as the reason for omitting her first name, when her male colleagues didn't follow that custom. Realizing that the director was right, she changed her authorship sort of designation from C.H. Payne to Cecilia H. Payne, the name she would use in all of her publications going forward. Two weeks later, as another discovery came to light, the two would rush another publication into print. This was sort of the pace of research that she would engage in and undertake in those early years while she was at Harvard. Now by this point, she was ready to build on the work of two earlier physicists to create what would be her most original research. 
the Indian physicist Meghnad Saha had been able to show from an analysis of spectral lines taken of various classes of stars that the distinctions in the spectral classes corresponded with differences in temperature. It had turned out that any jump cannon's ordering of Fleming's and Murray's scales matched the descending temperature scale with O stars being the hottest while M stars were cooler by a factor of 10 or so. Saha had shown that the hotter a star was, the more electrons of the atoms in the atmosphere jumped to higher energy levels. And, in the case of the hottest O and B stars, they were actually able to exit the atom entirely in that process known as ionization. By deriving the appropriate mathematical expressions from Bohr's original work for idealized stellar atmospheres at given temperatures, Saha predicted where the appropriate spectral lines for certain simple elements like hydrogen and helium would be found. He then compared these to the spectra taken as part of the Draper catalog at Harvard and found that they matched up pretty well. In doing this, he provided a physical mechanism to explain the spectra and establish temperature ranges for each of Cannon's spectral classes. Following on this, one of Payne's former professors at Cambridge University, Edward Arthur Milne, along with Ralph Fowler, refined Saha's results by accounting for the idea that stellar atmospheres would have much lower pressures than were achievable on Earth since they sort of just blended out into open space. This resulted in a higher level of ionization, and that assumption improved the agreement between Saha's theory and observation even more closely. So good were these models that they opened up the possibility that one might be able to calculate the relative abundances for various elements by looking at the characteristics of the spectral lines from those different elements in a given spectrum. This was the project Payne decided to undertake, and it was a difficult one. As she wrote, quote, I pressed on alone. It was clear that some quantitative method must be devised for expressing the intensities of the spectral lines, and I set up a crude system of eye estimates. Next came the identification of the line spectra, the selection of known lines for examination, and the arduous task of estimating their intensities on hundreds of spectra." End quote. In other words, she was just buried in the nitty-gritty of scientific modeling, the struggling to get the details of a representation to match the observed data, and it took Payne some time to find a path through the weeds. Finally, though, she was able to develop a method that gave accurate predictions for the element silicon in the hottest O stars. Once she was able to do this, not only was she able to narrow the temperature range of O stars from 23 to 28,000 Kelvin, but she also had a way to proceed with other elements. Throughout the latter half of 1923 and all of 1924, she calculated a way, pinning down element after element until she began to get a sense of how much of each thing there was. What she found in her research was truly stunning. While this is hard for us to sort of understand now, during the period of time leading up to this point, astronomers and astrophysicists had assumed that stars were made up not just of the same stuff as the Earth, but of the same stuff in the same proportions. It was sort of a natural assumption, especially when, with the advent of spectroscopy, the same elements had been found in both places. What Payne found, however, was that for almost every element, this sense of relative abundance held. If there was twice as much silicon on Earth as carbon, then there was twice as much silicon in the atmosphere of a star that she observed. However, what she also found was that for two elements, this relationship did not seem to hold true. For hydrogen, the abundance in the stars was a million times higher in a star's atmosphere than it was on the Earth. And for helium, that was about one-third the amount of hydrogen. In other words, a star's atmosphere seemed to be about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, and about 0.0001% everything else. The result was so unexpected that Shapley sent a copy of the pre-publication paper to the Princeton astronomer and the person who had been his graduate advisor, Henry Norris Russell. Russell looked the work over, and while he found no fault in Payne's analysis, he expressed his opinion that such an outcome must be wrong. As he wrote, quote, 
it is clearly impossible that hydrogen should be a million times more abundant than the metals, end quote. And this, by the way, would turn out to be one of the more infamous lines in astronomical history. Nevertheless, Payne reworked her conclusions to be a bit more tempered in her claims and submitted it as a portion of both her PhD dissertation and as something, as a paper, I should say, to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Among the results was that all of the various spectral classifications of stars showed the same abundances, leading to the inescapable conclusion that all spectral differences were due solely to temperature and not to composition. All stars were made of the same stuff, she said. The only difference is, when one looked at a spectrum, was because the stars were hotter or cooler. Now at this point, we need to say something about the culture of science and the claims by some that Russell's evaluation and possible suppression of Payne's results was an example of gender bias. There is no question that it was Russell's objections and concerns that caused Payne to temper her conclusions, but this need not be due to any question he might have had regarding her ability as a result of her gender. In science, Probably the most difficult bias to overcome is that of the familiar. From the time of Fraunhofer up until this point, everyone more or less assumed that all of the things in the universe had the same compositions because there was really no evidence to think otherwise. When Kirchhoff and Bunsen showed that the absorption lines in the sun's spectrum matched a variety of elements also found on Earth, it was natural to assume that it and by extension all of the stars, were made of the same stuff in the same amounts. In a sense, it was really an extension of Newton's principle of universality. The trickier bit here, though, comes in when examining the claim of this sort of same abundances in light of Payne's evidence to the contrary. It's one thing to hold a position in light of an absence of data and evidence, but something else entirely to do so when results of scientific investigation begin to suggest that a viewpoint or a model is in error. This is why I call it bias of the familiar, and it's something that you see all through the history of modern astronomy. Someone like Herschel was always positing that there was some sort of, you know, life, the life existed on various bodies because he saw life on Earth and he thought that it must be ubiquitous. Carl Sagan, in an episode of Cosmos on the topic of spectra, relates the story that when Venus was first observed with enough detail, astronomers saw that it was covered with clouds and thus they couldn't see the surface. From this, they assume that the world must be covered with water, since that's really what forms clouds here on Earth. When spectroscopy revealed that the primary component of Venus's atmosphere was actually carbon dioxide rather than water vapor, the model was changed to the world being covered with something like carbonated water. It wasn't until temperature estimates from the light being given off by the planet in the infrared part of the spectrum began to indicate that the surface temperature was greater than 700 Kelvin or 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which was far above the temperature than any liquid water could exist, that the water mo world models were finally abandoned. This is a great example of the, what we call that bias of the familiar. Familiarity bias is really a hard thing to overcome in scientific hypothesizing, and more than anything, I think, that's what happened in the case of Russell and Payne's correspondence. The other thing, of course, is something known to anyone who has studied under a more experienced and respected person in the field. While, you know, the information or the data or the hypotheses are always supposed to stand on their own merit, there's always a real hesitation to sort of stand in opposition to what a person who has more experience thinks is true, even in the face of evidence. Even if the methodology of analysis is sound, as was most certainly the case here, there's always the possibility of another explanation that is more in line with the prevailing set of ideas. The history of science has any number of examples of this being the case. Russell's doubts regarding Payne's conclusions and her and Shapley's willingness to acquiesce to them speak more to the view of a uniform universe than anything else, and maybe also that deference to the greater reputation and greater experience of the more seasoned Russell.
to the claim made by some that Russell was exhib exhibiting some version of gender bias towards Payne's work, i.e. that it was inferior because it was done by a woman, or that her conclusions carried less weight because of her gender, I haven't really been able to find any evidence of that in my research on the topic. That's not to say that it isn't there, but it should be noted that Shapley, a man well known for his advocacy on behalf of greater opportunity for women, concurred with Russell, the man who had been his dissertation advisor. Moreover, when Russell did eventually confirm Payne's results a few years later through a different avenue of investigation, he credited her with the initial discovery and pointed the readers of his paper back to her original work. Hardly the behavior of a misogynist, I think. For his part, Shapley trumpeted Payne's work, publishing her dissertation first as a new type of publication from the observatory as a standalone book titled Stellar Atmospheres at $2.50 a copy. When he read it, Russell declared it the best dissertation he had ever read. Quote, I am especially impressed, he wrote, with the wide grasp of the subject, the clarity of the style, and the value of Miss Payne's own results. End quote. It would be the first doctorate Harvard, I'll bet through our at Radcliffe College, would award to a woman in its history. Immediately following the awarding of her PhD, Cecilia traveled to England to attend the 1925 meeting of the International Astronomical Union held at Cambridge. The trip was extended to a summer-long stay to see family and assess what the future might hold. And in July of that year, Payne wrote to Shapley to express that while the trip hadn't resulted much in the way of scientific progress, it clarified in her mind that there was nothing in England for a woman of her training and interests. Her future was to be found in America and at the Harvard College Observatory, and so it was that she returned to continue her work there as a postdoctoral fellow. Upon her return, she rented a small house not far from the observatory and was surprised to find that she enjoyed the domesticity it brought to her life. After having spent the last two years in a frenzy of work, often sleeping in the brick building at the observatory, she found the keeping of a house a welcome change. For so long, she had felt the need to fight against the ever-present societal restrictions erected against women in various roles. Now, she took pleasure in the simple tasks of preparing a meal or mending a garment, knowing that doing such things no longer meant that she had given in to the expectations of a culture that said she should aspire to nothing more. As author Dava Sobel writes, quote, Miss Payne had pictured herself, quote, a rebel against the feminine role, end quote, before recognizing that her real rebellion was, quote, against being thought and treated as an inferior, end quote. She did not mind at all being treated as different. As she wrote, quote, of course women are different from men. Their whole outlook and approach are a testimony to it, end quote. So long as none of her fellow scientists looked down on her on account of her sex, end quote. By this time, there was little chance of that sort of thing, as Annie Jump Cannon, now holder of several degrees, both earned and honorary, could both bake a batch of oatmeal cookies for a seminar and then lecture to that seminar with all the authority her years of experience brought to a subject. Additionally, more than a dozen of the calculators had been hired because they had earned degrees in physics or astronomy from women's colleges and more were arriving each year to work and earn advanced degrees. Additionally, under Shapley's direction, women who had earned doctorates from other institutions, such as the University of California, were now arriving to do additional research from the vast library of photographic plates that had continued to accumulate in the observatory stores. In short, Cecilia Payne had found a place in a community that accepted her for her scientific contributions and placed no stigma on her due to her gender. This is not to say, though, that certain barriers to advancement still had yet to be overcome. Even as Payne continued to do groundbreaking research for the observatory, the president of the observatory, a brother of Percival Lowell, continued to block all attempts to recognize women with official roles at the university. 
Undeterred, she finally took up the work left unfinished by Henrietta Leavitt on photographic photometry, i.e. the determination of the brightness of a star from a picture taken of it through a telescope as well as a much more contested question, that of the interstellar absorption of light. This question, the one that sort of really captured Payne's imagination during this time, asked whether it was appropriate to assume that the space between the stars was empty. While Shapley advocated that such views were, in fact, the correct ones, unless one could actually observe any obscuring material, Cecilia wasn't so sure. If there was a very small and diffuse amount of gas or dust between an object and an observer, that da gas or dust might go undetected, but still cause a slight dimming of the object, thus making it seem to be further away than it really was. It was a project she would work on and off of throughout her career, as she helped Shapley attempt to map the size and shape of the Milky Way galaxy, which, by the way, in and of itself is a really difficult problem. We're inside of the Milky Way. We're kind of part of that structure, and yet by trying to look out from inside of that structure, we're trying to determine what it actually is. In 1928, Payne attended the International Astronomical Union meeting in Leiden, along with a large contingent from Harvard, including her fellow heavenly twin, Adelaide Ames, and another graduate student, Priscilla Fairchild. Fairchild would make the acquaintance of one Bart Bach, who had been assigned by Leiden University to assist the group with anything they needed. While Fairchild initially ignored his interest, his perseverance and good charms eventually won both her and Shapley over, and soon a position was found for him at the observatory. Before long, the two were wed, thus finally breaking the old adage that the brick building was a bit like heaven, where men and women are never given in marriage. In 1932, though, Tragedy struck the observatory family, and Miss Payne particularly, when Adelaide Ames, after spending the summer working with Shapley to catalog the spiral galaxies photographed over the year on Harvard's plates, drowned as a result of a boating mishap. While the astronomical community worldwide mourned the loss of Ames, Cecilia was devastated that her closest friend and person she most admired in the world was gone. In the future, she resolved to honor the memory of her friend and colleague by working to give more of herself as a human being. As we mentioned, she was by nature shy and retiring, but now she would try to open herself up. And so it was that, not long afterwards, she fell in love for the first time. Unfortunately, as is so often the case with that initial romance, things did not work out, leaving her feeling even more bereft. In her time in despair... Bart and Priscilla Bach took her into their care and suggested that she get away from the observatory and Cambridge with its frequent reminders in order to come to terms with their grief. Seeing the wisdom in this advice, she once again traveled to Europe, this time not as much as a member of a scientific delegation, but as a touring scientist who mixed personal business with work. It was near the end of this trip that she visited the Polkovo Observatory and saw the privations suffered by its staff under the rule of Joseph Stalin. The experience, as wrenching as it was, helped her put her personal grief into some sort of perspective and allowed her to once again begin to move forward. It was shortly after this that she met her husband-to-be, Sergei Gospostian, the story related in this episode's introduction. While their marriage in March of 1934 was a surprise to the entire staff of the observatory, save Shapley, the couple suited each other and the relationship was a happy one. Later that year, Cecilia was the recipient of the first Annie Jump Cannon Prize given by the American Astronomical Society. In 1938, with a change of leadership at Harvard, the contributions of women were once again formally recognized by the university. That year, Payne Gaboshkin was named the Phillips Astronomer by Harvard, thus granting her a permanent position at the university. Now the mother of two children, Edward and Catherine, she and Sergei bought a home and property in Lexington, not too far from Cambridge. The two immigrants had put down roots. Throughout the war years, the two worked together in a place severely depleted by the departure of many of its staff, staff to serve in the war effort. 
In addition to their astronomical work, they bought a small farm and took in a Japanese minister displaced by the policies of the Roosevelt administration towards those viewed as being possibly sympathetic to the enemies of the United States. They hosted gatherings at the observatory's library that they named the Forum on International Problems to foster understanding and discuss the issues of the day. Their scientific work during this time focused on variable stars. With the end of the war came the recriminations of the physics and astronomical community for having helped birth the atomic age. Chief among those who asked questions that made others uncomfortable was Shapley who, for his trouble, had the leadership structure of the observatory reorganized. While he remained its director, much of the other responsibilities were handed over to an oversight committee that, for the most part, consisted of members of the staff, including Payne Kaposchkin. Thus, for the rest of her career, Cecilia would remain intimately tied to the daily work of the place even as it formed a partnership with the Smithsonian Institution in order to more fully leverage the resources of both places. During this time, she grew close also to the enigmatic Antonia Murray, who viewed Cecilia as the daughter she never have, and who the younger woman came to appreciate as the maverick who had bucked the status quo long before she had arrived under Shapley's oversight. In 1956, she would be elected Harvard's first full professor as well as chair of the astronomy department, and in 1976, she was awarded the prestigious Henry Russell Norris Prize. She would die just three years later, having lived a full, productive, and mostly happy life, a life spent in the pursuit of the knowledge of the universe. While she worked in many areas, her two greatest contributions were the supervising of a large number of female students through the graduate work and the determination of the true composition of the matter that makes up all that we see when we look out into the heavens. The picture of the cosmos we have today is due, in large part, to that work she did over the years between 1923 and 1925, when she was a newly arrived British emigre set out to prove that women could do astronomy too. As we bring this episode and this short series on the women who did so much work at the Harvard College Observatory to a close, allow me to make a few concluding remarks. I have focused on the lives and work of five of the literally dozens of women who made contributions to the astronomical discoveries made there. While these are the most consequential, it should be emphasized that as is almost always the case, this work was not done in isolation or by one single individual toiling alone in some cloistered room. What we see at the Harvard Observatory is a scientific community that collaborated and shared ideas and work to achieve notable results. First under the direction of Edward Pickering and then Harlow Shapley, the staff of the observatory undertook a research program that was unparalleled not just for years but for decades. This work was supported by many, but most especially by visionary women such as Anna Draper and Catherine Bruce, who saw, along with Pickering and Shapley, a role for women in scientific research when many others didn't. It is a remarkable story, and, as has often been the case, we've just scratched the surface. I would like to encourage anyone who'd like to learn more about all of this to read Dava Sobel's book, The Glass Universe. As a follow-up to last week's digression episode, my presentation at the AAPT meeting seemed to go pretty well, and so today's shout-out goes to anyone joining the podcast after having heard of us from that presentation. As a part of that session, also, I got to hear of the plan to establish an updated version of the International System of Units based on the fundamental constants of the universe. While efforts along those lines have been going on since the 1960s, the hardest of the units to get away from being attached to a physical artifact is, as we said last week, the kilogram. <laughs> 
The kilogram, by the way, to this day, is actually defined by a mass housed in a vault in Paris and a set of comparison masses associated with that. Efforts are now underway to use something known as a watt balance to define the kilogram in terms of the fundamental charge of the electron and something known as Planck's constant. If these efforts are successful, as there is every reason to think they will be, the entire system will be reestablished in terms of seven universal constants in 2019. Finally, as always, thanks for being a part of the crew. If you haven't already done so, I hope I can convince you to take just a few moments to leave us a positive review on whatever service you use to enjoy the podcast. Also, if you have someone you know that might enjoy the content of the show, why not let them know about it, either by directing them to the podcast website, the Scientific Odyssey, all one word, dot typepad, dot com, or to our Facebook page. Also, if you have comments or suggestions about the show, you can contact me directly, either at cldavies at mac.com or on Twitter, where you can follow me at Chad Davies. Next week, we're going to step back a bit and pick up a thread we've left dangling for a few episodes regarding the work of Henrietta Swan-Levitt and those things known as Cepheid variables. It turns out that prior to being named director of the Harvard Observatory, Harlow Shapley was able to use her relationship to gain a deeper insight into our place in the Milky Way galaxy. So until then, full sails on your journey.